Today, I want to talk to you about the final wrath of God. We have talked about the wrath of God, and uh, we have talked about seven seal judgments. We have covered seven trumpet judgments. We have covered five of the seven bowl judgments. And uh, we are going to cover the last two this day. And let me give you the outline in your bulletin. Only two points today. Amen. Amen. <laughs> if, <laughs> James, I, I normally don't call names, but I know that voice. <laughs> I'm taking my whole time to do these two points. All right. Will y'all stay with me if I go a couple of minutes over? Yes. Okay. Thank you. That's the right answer. Number one. God will gather his enemy. God will gather his enemies. And that seems a little strange, but here's the deal, folks. God's in control of everybody. God's in control of everything. He can move Christians around. He can move lost people around to do his work for him, which is exactly what uh, he is doing in this text. Number two, God will finish his judgment. Folks, there's an ending to everything, okay? Mankind, we're not going to live on this world forever. And my prayer is, I will not see death. My prayer is, we will all go up in the rapture, all right? So it's an exciting thing, but God finishes everything, and he will do his judgment also. You know, the wrath of God against sin and his final judgment of sinners are reoccurring themes throughout the Word of God. The greatest wrath of God will be for all to see, and it is seen in Revelation chapter 16, which is the final bowl judgments. After these seven intense judgments occur, the Lord Jesus Christ will return to destroy the world, world's armies and establish his universal rule here on earth. And that is the second coming. And I told you early on in our study, there's a huge difference between the rapture of the church and the second coming. The rapture of the church will start the tribulation period, and the second coming will end the uh, tribulation period. Man, I had a brain fog there for a minute. This millennium kingdom will last for 1,000 years here on earth. Despite these years of horrific uh, judgment, sinners will stubbornly hang onto their sins and rebel against God and the truth of his holy word. Let's look at these last two bold judgments where God's final appeal for repentance and salvation is ignored. And folks, God doesn't make anybody uh, obey him. God doesn't make anybody be saved. We have a choice. Every person has to make their own choice whether they accept or reject the Word of God, whether they accept or uh, accept salvation. And folks, here it is plain with all that we've seen in these last seven judgments, you would be a wise person to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Let's look at Revelation 16, verse 12. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates. Notice lots of times in the bowls, he pours it out on earth, okay? But this time, he pours it out on the river Euphrates. And we have to understand that the river Euphrates uh, was a huge river. It runs 1,800 miles from Mount Ararat to the Persian Gulf. It is the eastern boundary of the land of Israel. And then it says, and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And the crossing of the Euphrates River, you have to understand, would have been really, really difficult. Remember the bowl where we said excessive heat had come down and scorched people something that they were gnawing on their tongues and they were ready to just die. And that would melt all the glaciers. That would melt all, uh, you know, the, the, the mountaintop, the snow and, and things. And so the Euphrates River at this time would be huge. 
it would be nearly impossible to cross. But it's kind of like the Jordan River. It's kind of like the Red Sea. When Moses put his staff down and won't. Folks, I believe God can do anything. I believe every miracle in the Word of God is true. It is yes, and it is amen. So he, for his purpose, it almost sounds like it's for the king's purposes, but it's not. He wants to get them where he wants them, and he can use any force of nature. When you look at the Revelation and you look at all these bold judgments, folks, he's moving around forces of nature many, many times, and these last two, he's doing it big time. And I'll show that to you in just a second. So its water was dried up so the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And there are ten kings. And I've even had people ask me, can you name the ten kings? And I could name some of them, but it would still be my opinion. It is not important exactly who these kings are. What's important is they will be defeated and their kingdoms will be destroyed. Now, in my opinion, I'm telling you, I don't think you can leave China off there, and I don't think you can leave North Korea off there. All right, I'm not picking on them, but they are very, I mean, they're very adamant about, you know, where they stand. And these countries that are not lining up with Israel, I'm telling you, they're going to be destroyed. Israel is God's chosen people, and we need to remember that. Verse 13, and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. This almost sounds like a horror picture, doesn't it? But it's exactly what God has planned. When you think of frogs, the only other place you see frogs in the Word of God is with the plagues, the plagues of fall, the of frogs in Egypt. But here, all right, these unclean spirits, folks, he describes them in the next verse at spirits of demons. And again, he allows these things to happen, setting up everything for the battle of Armageddon. So when you look at the frogs coming out, and again, you have to remember that like the sixth trumpet, remember he released 200 million demons at that time. So there will probably even be more of those, and he's gathered them all into one place. And these, these demons are influencing these kings. And, and they are pawns, folks. They are pawns on God's chessboard. He is getting them ready and lining them up to destroy them. So it says, out of the mouth of the dragon, which is Satan, the mouth of the beast, which is the Antichrist, and the mouth of the false prophet, who is the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons, performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and to the whole world, and to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. You can see his purpose in this. He is drawing them in. He is letting the demonic forces out. And there is going to be this big clash, this huge battle, this final battle, which will end the judgment. And these folks, will uh, they will have the wrath of God on their lives. And when you think about that, folks, uh, it is going to be a solemn time. It is going to be a serious time. It is going to be a time like we have never seen in our lives. Look at Joel chapter 3. I keep trying to go back and forth and let you understand how important Bible prophecy is. And the prophet Joel speaks of this in Joel chapter 3. And if you look at the title of that, God judges the nations. Look down with me in verse 9. Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords 
and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble and come, all of you nations, and gather all around, because your mighty ones to go down there, O Lord. Let the nations be awakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, or, or, or for there where they would sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. And we know what a sickle is for. It's what the farmers used way back when, before combines. And they cut uh, uh, the hay at the bottom, right next to the earth, and it just cut them down. Come, come, go down, for the wine press is full. What is he talking about? He's talking about when the blood, and, and we will see this in chapter 17 and see this in chapter 19. There will be so much blood shed, it'll be halfway up a horse there. And you can see that wine press, that's what it does. It it squishes those grapes and the juice comes out. The vats overflow, for the wickedness is great. Multitudes and multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Folks, I'm telling you, you have a decision to make today. Are you going to follow Christ? Are you going to listen to the Holy Spirit? Or are you in control of your own life? And folks, I I just can't say this enough, folks. The rapture of the church is close. I believe it could happen any day. And God has given you another opportunity to be saved. God has given you another opportunity to get right with Him And we will share that with you in just a second. And the day of the Lord is that great day, that battle of Armageddon. So we see God gathering his enemies together. The second thing I want you to see is God will finish his judgments. Now notice verse 15. There's a pause right in the middle of these two uh, bold judgments. And again, it's a reminder You see this all through the book of Revelation. There's these pauses. There's these gaps. And and, and it is in red if you have a red-lettered Bible. This is Jesus Christ himself speaking. Folks, he's the one that's going to orchestrate the battle of Armageddon. He's the one that's going to be coming with us, all right, on a white horse. He's the one uh, that died on a cross for our sins. He is the one that has the power of God and that he will rule and reign during that millennium period. Behold, I come as a thief. Now, what is he saying? You are not going to know when he comes. If someone tells you this is the date that he's coming, you can tell that person without a shadow of a doubt, he's not coming that day. Why? Because you just said it. All right? Only God knows that day. Only God. And he's sitting up in heaven, and I'm telling you, there could be somebody today come down this aisle and it's like Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. That could be the last person. That could set all of eternity going. That could start the rapture of the church. And folks, I'm not trying to scare anyone. I'm trying to tell you he's given people more than one chance. If he gave you one chance to be saved, he's a fair God. And he does. He speaks to mankind. It's not always through a gospel presentation. You know, there are people that can't read or write, but they look at nature and they see the sun come up and they see God all about them, all about them. And God is trying to say, hey, get saved before it's too late. Come to Jesus. I'm coming as a thief. Now look at this. Blessed, happy is he who watches and keeps his garment, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. What is blessed? This is the third beatitude in the book of Revelations. There are seven beatitudes altogether, and this is the third one. And we will see the others. But what he has basically said, it it really is kind of in soldiers' terminology. In war times... All right. Many times you did not have time to rest. You did not have time uh, uh, to, to, you know, uh, get on your armor and get on all these things. So they would literally sleep 
in their soldier and in their armor and things so that if that trumpet sounded, if war, if people attacked them surprisingly, they would be ready. And folks, we as Christians have an armor, and it's the armor of God. We need to be ready for Satan's attack. We need to keep our spiritual ears open. We need to depend on the Holy Spirit to say, hey, no, I, I am not doing that. I, I've got my armor on, and I'm under the divine protection of God. And we need that armor. And he is saying, this pause between the sixth and the seventh is, be ready. Be ready. Be ready at all times. So then it says, and they gathered them together to a place called the Hebrew Armageddon. And when you think about Armageddon, it is, uh, and again, the, the exact place, you know, that it could move around, you know, uh, just a little, but I believe it'll be 60, 60 miles north of Jerusalem. And when you look out from the Jezreel Valley to Mount Tabor, uh, you know, you could see in this place, there was over 200 battles, Old Testament uh, and, and New Testament, that they were fought in these places. And it is a flat, plain place. It is a place where literally millions of soldiers and millions in the army could all do battle in that one place. And that is exactly what God is doing here. He is gathering these folks for this last epic battle. Folks, you know who wins, folks. Our God wins. Number two, God will finish his judgments. Look at verse 17. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne of God, saying, It is done. So the seventh angel, who has the seventh bowl, which is the last bowl, the last judgment, threw it into the air, okay? Why the air? Because what does the New Testament say about Satan? He is the prince and the power of the air. You think about this, folks. The internet, all this, all you do online, phones, cell phones, all that, what are they? They're towers and they, they're on the air. All these things, folks, there are programs on TV. I'm telling you, they're straight out of the pit of hell. We don't need to be watching this junk, okay? It clutters our mind, okay? It, it tempts us in ways we don't need. So God's going to clear the air, okay? He is not going to, it's not a clean it, it's clearing it, Okay? And the loud voice, obviously, which came out of the temple, which we seen last week that God was in his temple, all right, it's God. It's God speaking. It's God's voice. And he, he says this, it is done. Hey, what did Jesus do when he died on a cross? He said, it is finished. Oh, folks, there's an ending to everything. Jesus Christ, who was born of a virgin. Jesus Christ, who lived a perfect life. Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins. Jesus Christ, three days later, ended, uh, arose from the dead. They ended his earthly life, folks, but he is the only person, only person that lived forever on earth. So, just as Jesus said, it's finished. His work had been done. God is saying, it is done. And there were noises and thunders and lightning. There was a great earthquake. Such a mighty earthquake has not occurred since men were on earth. Oh, folks, we've seen some devastating earthquakes. We've seen earthquakes where thousands of people have died. We have seen them on the Richter scale, you know, in the ni eights and the nines. But this particular one will come close to destroying the earth. It'll be the earthquake of all earthquakes. And it says, now the great city was divided into three parts, 
and the cities of the nations fell. And here's where, where I want to say you, there's, there's two opinions here. This great city, I believe, is talking about Babylon. Why? Because he's talking about Babylon all the way through this chapter. And you have to have that flow of scriptures. You have to take in consideration the context of the text. He is speaking to Babylon. And I'm telling you, some guys a lot smarter than me. I am not a Bible scholar, okay? I study the Word of God. I tell you what the Holy Spirit tells me. But there are two writers in particular that have said this is the new Jerusalem. But you have to understand, he is not finished here, okay? He is finishing the bowl, the the seventh bowl. I believe the next thing that's going to happen is the new Jerusalem. But I still think because it says it before and because it says it after, he is speaking of Babylon and not the new Jerusalem. And it says, and great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And again, folks, you can even see, we use this phrase like, man, that dude's out of control. Okay, that, guy, that dude went crazy. And, and I'm not saying God is doing that. I'm saying all the forces that he have will happen in this last bowl. He is going to destroy the earth as we know it, and many, many, many thousands of people are going to die. Okay, that, that's what he's talking about. In verse 20, then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And great hell, hell from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. So we have these thunders and lightnings. We have all these, this earthquake going. And folks, this affects not just Babylon. This affects everyone, everyone. And here we look at the hailstone. The, 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 the biggest hailstone on record right now weighs about two pounds. A talent is a hundred pounds. Folks, it will destroy everything in its sight. I mean, you cannot survive that. You cannot. And so we can see the seriousness of this last. We can see how God uh, is just saying, enough's enough. He has given them time. They had 144,000 Jewish Guys, witnessing, and we had an angel giving them the gospel. Four times in regulation, the gospel has been presented to them. And they keep saying no, and no, and no. And folks, God says, I'm drawing a line in the sand. This is it. This is your last chance. And when you look at that and see how this world will be, how it's going to be destroyed, but look what the next verse says. But men blaspheme God because of the, the plague of hell, since the plague was exceedingly great. Those who survive, those few that survive, are still cursing God, blaspheming God, mad at God. Oh, folks, God is a fair God. God is a just God. He is just bringing these, this judgment to close. And we have to understand that. I believe it is Babylon that he is talking about. And when you think of islands and mountains being uh, uh, destroyed and hailstones, a hundred pounds, you can see the devastation that is going to happen. And look at the word we said earlier, the three words, it is done. Turn over to Revelation 21. Revelation 21, I'm just going to give you a picture. Revelation 21. Man, do you hear them pages turning? Isn't that awesome? Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write these words, for they are faithful and true. And he said to me, Here it is. It is done. Oh, folks, God, if you read the whole chapter, which we don't have time to do. It's talking about that new 
heaven. It's talking about the earth as we know it is gone. And folks, I am telling you, we are going to God's house. In my house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. It is done. And then it says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of thee the fountain of water of life freely to him who thirsts. And he who overcomes shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he will be my son. Now, folks, when we get raptured out of here, we will be with God forever and ever and ever and ever. Hallelujah. Look at verse 8. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, sexual immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Oh, folks, we don't have to die without Christ. We live in the day of grace. Any time you choose, any time the Holy Spirit speaks to you, you can be saved. You can get right with Him. Hebrews chapter 3. Look at Hebrews 3 with me. Hebrews 3 verse 7. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as in the day of rebellion. And folks, that's what happened to these people that were still here during these last seven bold judgments. They hardened their heart. Okay? They said, I'm not listening. They're saying, I'm not, I'm not worshiping any God. I am my own God. And folks, America is just that way. It's about me. It's about what I want. It's my life. And I understand that, but I'm just telling you, folks, you wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for Almighty God. In the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me and, and, and tried me and saw my works 40 years, therefore I was angry with that generation and said, they always will go astray in their heart, and they have not known, uh, not, not known my way. So I swore my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Folks, God did it to the children of Israel, and many, many, many of them died in the wilderness because they would not do and, and, and take the free gift of salvation. They would not take what God had for them. Verse 12, Beware, brethren, lest there be any of you uh, uh, have an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you uh, be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Folks, sin hardens our heart. When we sin one time, I mean, you know, you should come under conviction. But if you keep doing it over and over and over again, you get where it doesn't bother bother you. And that's that hardening of the heart he speaks of. Verse 14, For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Today, if you uh, will hear his voice, do not harden your heart, as in the rebellion. Oh, folks, you could have said no to Christ many times, but maybe God has brought, to you, brought you to this place, to this day. Maybe God has opened that light and He has shown the light of the gospel. Maybe He is telling you today, hey, go to Christ. Go to Christ. Then the last one, 2 Peter, 2 Peter 3, And I close with this, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, we've already said that, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. We've talked about that. Both the earth and the works therein it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, in what manner of persons ought you to be, in holy conduct and godliness. Why did God leave you here? 
so that you can show and shine the light of Jesus to others. Do you realize that some people that you are around, the only Bible they read comes out of your mouth? The only life that they can see as a Christian is you. And folks, he is saying it's so important. I'm not talking about sinless perfection. We all mess up. But we need to be quick to say, I'm sorry. We need to be quick to say, I shouldn't have said that. We need to be quick to let our light shine, looking for and hasting the coming of the day of God. What's he talking about? Do you realize that when you lead someone to Christ, you are that person closer to Jesus coming again? That much closer. If you want to, it happen this year, lead somebody to Christ. I'm not saying it'll happen this year, but it'll get you closer, folks, because of the which of the heavens will dissolve, being on fire, the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for the new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Oh, folks, this place is burning up, man. It's gone. It will be destroyed. God in one, and, and we will look at the battle of Armageddon and see what happens. But we're not going to have to fight, folks. Jesus, with one swoop, with one of his word, just the right, the word is going to destroy all of God's enemy. And folks, what it tells me now is the day of salvation. Today is the day you could be saved. Father, thank you. Thank you, thank you for your word. And God, I know it just uh, seems harsh, the last two bowls. But God, you've, and we have, we live through a time of grace. And God, I pray if there's one person here that is not sure if they died today, they would go to heaven. God, I pray they would come down and talk to us. God, it may just be an assurance of salvation. But God, I pray that they would nail it down this day. God, I just pray for Christians. God, you say in your word, we just read it. You want us to be holy. You want our conduct to be good. You want us to be close to you. And God, I pray that, that our words and our deeds and our actions would be holy. Lord, there's others here that may need to rededicate their life or come for baptism or God, uh, just want to join our church. God, would you just speak to them today? They know who we are. They know what we're about. And if the Spirit says come, I pray that they would come. God, this is your church. This is your church. This is your invitation. God, I pray that you would do what you, what you choose, God. And I pray some this day will choose life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?